Good morning. How are you doing this morning, Rachel? I'm wonderful. How are you? Absolutely fantastic. We, we've got to talk about the foundation before we go anywhere because I want listeners to know your foundation in the way of getting really close to why you do what you do with Loveland. Yeah, the Loveland Foundation is a nonprofit I started in 2018, and I was coming out of a therapy session myself, and I was just feeling so grateful for the opportunity to heal through so many hard things and to have support through so many good things as well. And so I I wanted to find a way to get it to as many people in my community. And as a Black woman, that's the first people I thought of, Black women who are, um, you know, being the center, the foundation of their homes, their neighborhoods, their communities, their organizations and we uh, the team has been able to give tens of thousands of hours of free therapy to black women and girls really helping to break that financial barrier as well as you know of course the opportunity to pour into and support the uh, the hundreds of black therapists who don't get a ton of support in the field and who we need more of in the field and it's just been a really special project that has uh, that has been moving to me and for me and many others hindsight being the vision Isn't it kind of odd how you had to move through a storm in order to help other storms go silent themselves, but it had to start with you? Yes, yes. I think my work is uh, living out loud, feeling out loud, thinking out loud and changing out loud. And I'm I'm really grateful for the opportunity to move through things and offer space for others to do the same. And it's it is a it is a hindsight is 2020 where you're looking and saying, wow, those hard things really open the gate for my own healing and hopefully for for many, many others. There, there are many times when I'm out in the community that, that I have this this huge fear that we're becoming that generation of those old black and white photos where we would see our our relatives never smiling we've got to have people like yourself to continue the smile you've got to be able to feel what the community is doing together as one and 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 not just stare into a camera Mm-hmm. There's so many there's so many layers to how we might feel on any any particular time. And while I'm certainly not smiling all the time, one thing I can say is that I I am learning myself. And when you learn yes. yourself, you can move through the emotions and the feelings with a little more uh, a little more sturdy than the way that society might flop us around <laughs> with all of the emotions and feelings that come. And so I'm really I I think one of the things I'm most proud of is how uh, self knowing I am, and I'm very inspired by others who come with that and part of self knowing is healing through the things that uh, are conscious that are of that are unconscious that are subconscious and um that is what therapy offers us this opportunity to understand ourselves and move through the world with a little more ease um it might not always be happiness but it can be with a clarity and i find clarity to be um an incredibly beautiful thing to have you speak my street when you say learning about yourself i keep a defrag journal i it's question no ask the question then question the answer and you learn a, a lot about yourself when you when you answer your own personal questions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's so true. And one of the things that my mother taught me and that has really been a, a through line of my work and, and my relationships in the world is asking questions, being willing to. Yes. Sometimes we're so scared of the answers, we don't ask the questions. And so I hope that we all continue um, to build courage to ask the questions and trust that we ourselves and our community has some answers that we can move towards. When you talk about becoming more open with your truth, do you allow it and, and do you suggest it in, in the way that, because I keep a journal, but I don't hide my journal. You want to know more about me? It's right there on the pages. Anybody at any time can come and read it. To me, that's that's being open with my truth. What about you? Ooh, I, I, I'm, I am inspired by that. <laughs> I also, it took a lot I of also, years to do it, though. I'm telling you that. It took me seven years to finally take that step. Yes, and I think for those who are who aren't there, and there's so many people who are so far from from or, or who aren't even heading that direction. But honestly, the hardest truth we can come to is with ourselves when we're honest with ourselves. You know, one of the first big mental health moments for me was when I realized that some of the stories I was telling myself about my childhood just weren't true. That I had had to create these narratives in order to make me feel like things were okay to keep moving through the world. And so sometimes the hard 
hardest person to tell the truth to is ourselves. Yes. And so I think that's the first step is being willing to tell the truth to ourselves. And if we decide to tell it to others, that's a personal choice that may be inspiring to some. But for most of us, I think the biggest hurdle to get over is telling the truth to ourselves. How do you gain the attention of your true self? I, I, I use my real name and, and I'll say it in, in kind of a father like way. And all of a sudden I start paying attention. Do you, do you talk to yourself mm-hmm. in that manner as well? Oh, I certainly talk to myself often, but one of the things that I write about in my book is that I'm in constant conversation with my younger self and yes, with my older self. Yes. These versions of me that that give me different perspective of who I am in the world, that remind me of what I've learned, that give me insight of where I'm going. And I, you know, I say things like when I get out of the shower and I'm lotioning my body, I recognize that I'm lotioning the skin that a f- future version of myself will be living in. Yes. I'm kind to myself. I'm being intentional. I'm asking questions. So a lot of my own self knows is that relationship that I'm in with my younger self and my older self. Wow. That's so interesting. You say that because the one of one of the toughest conversations that I have is that people ask me why after 44 years am I still in broadcasting? And I say, because I don't have the courage to tell that 14 year old in Billings, Montana that I'm going to stop because that kid would never stop or I wouldn't be here today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. and and, And I love the ways you get to honor him now. Yeah. So when you're when you're changing people's lives, I mean, that's that's a seed that has now become a plant that is now providing fruit. There is a harvest. That's a journey that you get to fall witness to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, and I feel I feel grateful for that. And that I love that analogy that you use because uh, the Loveland Foundation is the philanthropic space of my entire company called the Loveland Group. And I really find my career to be a landscape that I tend to, that I plant new things, that I invite others in to plant with me, that I invite others in to witness the flowering of things, the fruiting of things. And I I feel very grateful. You know, I'm 34 years old and I feel like I'm just getting started and the landscape seems vast and it seems expansive and I'm excited to continue to till this ground. Well, as a 61 year old man, I'm telling you, you're just getting started because, you know, it's, you're, you're still a baby you're, you're you're still growing and 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 what you're about to discover in life i mean th- this is leadership at birth thank you i appreciate that i appreciate that so much are we truly hurting inside or are we hiding ourselves inside Mm, I think we're hurting. I I don't think I would ever deny that we're hurting. And I think that hurt causes us to hide. Um, And I think healing is is kind of an invitation to be seen. Um, And it's scary to be seen. I mean, this book is a memoir and writing a memoir requires you to Mm -hmm. one some of my own truths for me to question my stories. You know, while I was writing and I had to call my mom and be like, wait, did this actually happen? Um, is this true for me or for the people that I'm writing about? And so I, I, I think that part of the healing is coming out of, of hiding. Um, and it's, it's okay to acknowledge hurt. We're all hurting. And sometimes that's the hardest part to acknowledge that we have been hurt. And so um, I, it's, it's, a, it's a journey. It's a through line. I don't know if there's necessarily an ending, but we can continue to cultivate tools to help us move through uh, this lifetime and search for ways to be well. At Loveland, when, when you're when you're helping somebody grow stronger and more confident, what happens is it also changes the family front. And, and so many times when I've sat with different writers, they've said that, well, I have to stop because my husband doesn't like my, the new me. How do you deal with those moments where family members want the old self to come back? Mm, I, I get that. I understand that. And, and, and that's okay. I don't think it's, it's something to fight against, but we can take those small steps to introduce who introduce our new selves. And maybe it's making us come to some conclusions that we might have to invite other newer people into our world as well, who see us for ourselves. It doesn't mean we have to completely let go of things, but things can shift. Our, our relationships are a shape and it can shape shift. It might've been a circle and it might be a triangle now, or it might be a smaller circle. And, and we have the permission and space to do so. And I hope people consider how, how we can shape shift in order to be in the world with our truest selves. You're talking about shape shifting and that to me, I call that transitioning. And, and I take a transition walk because the one thing that we don't do is we don't study our transitions. We just, you know, throw it away as saying, Oh, I'm just moody today. No, you're transitioning. Tell me about your transition. Yeah, I, I I really like that because it is it's uh for me it's very intriguing. It's in, I, I I'm really inspired by transformation yep. right now. 
my mother passed away in November. And what what uh, loss does for me is it, it it has made me desperate to remember that things can change. Death can feel so static. Mm-hmm. It can feel so permanent. And so in my own desperation to witness something change, it has made me hyper vigilant mm-hmm. to the things that change from, you know, the tree outside of my window and seeing it go from winter to flowering to the leaves and back again. Um, you know, these these moments of transformation are beautiful reminders. And luckily, nature shows us it every single day. This Can you believe the sun comes up every single time? It is so right. loyal. It doesn't change. That, that blows my mind that I know when I go to sleep, it will be here in the morning. And it might look different. The moon will change, but it will be there. And I, I love this idea that we can be there. We can show up and we might change. We might shift. Um, but but we are here. And and I'm inspired by, by the living and the changing and the shape-shifting, the transformation, as you said. If you were in this studio right now, you everything that you just said would be overlooking this forest that we created in 1997 because, I mean, we're 23 feet up in the air, so that means that these trees that are outside this window, I get to see the birds, a hawk, I get to see the deer down on the ground. I mean, you're so right about that. Paying attention to nature is a source of learning. Yes, yes. It, it, of learning, of inspiration. As a creative, it's a muse. As a human, it's a reminder. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm very grateful for the ways we can pay attention. What is one of the escapes or one of the easy walks that you can get people to grow with? I mean, it, I, I think that planting plants is, is, a, is a way to build up the, the truth and the trust in relationships. Mm, yes. So very uh, rationally, I think finding like a walking route yes. in in your space, allow yourself to see the seasons change, pay attention to a tree, build a relationship with something mundane and see the wonder in that, you know, cr- things that we think just come to us like courage, like thoughtfulness, like uh, whatever other ideas of what a quote unquote good person is or what a f- full person is. These are things that we have to practice. They're muscles that we have to build. So I am going to continue to build my muscle of wonder, to build my muscle of inspiration, to build my muscle of, of thoughtfulness and, and, and doing these regular practices. It's a practice. It's a ritual to be intentional in those ways. And I think going on a daily walk, maybe the same route and witnessing the differences or the sameness every day uh, uh, is a relationship one can build. So true. And don't take a digital device. Take the earplugs out and, and pay Even attention. Even the earplugs to out. <laughs> yes, me and my brother. And talking because I live in New York City, so earplugs are like closed when you walk out of the house, and so the thought of walking around without earphones can be so overwhelming, both from the sounds that you'll hear, but also people coming up and speaking to you, which I also have found to be moving. Like, wow, we have space to see and chat with each other. So yes, I, I agree. Go, go just with yourself and see what, see what comes. Wow. My, the walk that we took in New York city, I, I still hold on to it today because I did like the sounds of New York city, the cars and the people that, that would walk by. You had no idea what their conversation was about, but for a brief second, you were part of it. That to me is energy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I agree. I mean, that's why I live. That's why I moved here. I'm from Ohio originally. I'm from uh, the Midwest. And so moving here, the energy is palpable and it motivates me and it pushes me forward. And uh, it's, I, I feel so grateful to be part of the material of this place. Don't you think that we've become the society that likes to write the story before the event happens? We sit there and we try, we, we get so worried and worked up over something that hasn't even happened yet. Mm, well, I don't know if we're the society. I think humanity is the humanity that does. That. <laughs> um, yes, I think. And, and I guess I'll take it. I, I guess I'll I think the thing that makes that a negative experience is that often we're we're, uh, you know, assuming the worst. But within my book, I really talk about what does it look like to fantasize something? We use fantasy to talk about sexual things often, but I fantasize about like what types of meals I'll be eating with friends in 10 years. I fantasize about, you know, how comfortable I might be in my body as I continue to build relationship with it. There are stories that we can create that curate, you know, something really meaningful and not just curate uh, what, what might go wrong or how we might get more power or how we might, you know, 
feel feel more in control of things. And I, I hope that people can continue to build the skill and be more thoughtful about what stories we are building because stories are what build our world. It's the mm-hmm. only thing that does. And uh, so I, I hope we're more critical about how we build those. What's great about your book, Rachel, is the fact that it's almost like you sat down with a writing instrument and you said, dear future reader, you, you have no idea who's going to pick this book up, but yet you felt mm-hmm. in your heart, dear future reader. Yeah, I think there's someone, you know, that the the version of myself that wrote that book, I certainly would have loved to have a book like it to know what was to know that things were possible. You know, I talk about my decision not to have children. Mm. I talk about leaving uh, the Ivy League to study independently. I talk about uh, my my divorce and how I was married to a very wonderful man, but he just wasn't good for me and that I still felt like I deserved, um, you know, for him to have something different and for me to have something different. And these are all things that uh, I often didn't know were possible until I did them. And I want other people to know that there are options. And it's not even that I want you to make my choices. I just want you to know there are choices. And so this this book really is a letter to anyone who is on a brink of a renaissance, of a reimagining of themselves Mm -hmm. and want to remember what is possible everything is possible say yes to yes. yourself I'm just I mean that, that's the thing that's the one thing I've learned is that don't say no because you're never going to get that opportunity again say yes yes and don't say yes to just anything right. say yes to the thing are meaningful for you. We we are so we are told who we are who we are supposed to be before we even come out of the womb. As soon as they find out what the sex of the baby is, we've made decisions about how they might live, who they might be, what they might do. And then once you're here, you know, in the classroom or within a religious structure, within patriarchy, within capitalism, there's so many ways we are told who we are. And in the book, I invite people to ask some questions to really decide who is our chosen self, and then go out and live that way. When you pour yourself onto a page and you're sharing your history that to me is like the Swedish death cleaning you have now cleansed your heart you've cleansed your body what grows next because all of a sudden your creative level is has has a new frontier Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I'm very inspired by that I'm very grateful and it's it's more of the same uh, of a different hue it's more of the same of this this intrigue uh, about what is possible more of this intention to reimagine and just the just sitting in the ease the joy the abundance of knowing that I I am continue to learn myself and in continuing to inviting continuing to invite others to do the same and I'm I'm excited to witness the arc of my work um, I'm I'm you know I'm 34 and I'm just I feel like I'm just getting started and so I'm excited to see the arc of my work and see the arc of my readers um, who are coming along with me. You speak with pride when you use that word intention. And so when, when I hear that, that tells me that you believe in meditation. I do. I do very much so. Yeah, because I mean, you it, intentions. I mean, it's like when I take an intention walk, it, that's what it's about It's say your intentions. Now bring them to life. Yeah. And just know, you know, I often say when you when you're really wanting to get a red convertible, all of a sudden you see them all over on the highway or on the streets because it's in your mind. And I feel like that's the same way in in the book. I talk about how I had really studied how I wanted my career to look like way back when I was, you know, in my early 20s. And as I continued to go out and search for it, I saw it because I was thinking about it so much. I saw who might be a good fit to work with. I saw what things I might read and learn. And so that self-knowing and that intention allows you to kind of build out exactly what you're looking for. And often you find it much, you find the things that you want much easier when you think about them quite a bit than when you just kind of let things fall into your lap. When you take your walks, have you ever taken a recording device with you and recorded as you were walking what was moving through you? Because I love going back and just listening to it because by the time I get back home, I I have no idea what I said, but then I go and listen to it. (laughs) Ooh, I like that idea. No, you know, I'm even a bad journaler. I don't even journal really. I, I, the, what you all see in my book is my outside thinking. I'm, I'm trying to get better at it because I do want to hold on to my thoughts more. Um, but I really love that idea. And I'm going to try it. And I hope some more of your listeners because do that we're, too. Because we're, we're instruments. We're tools. We, we, you know, maybe the trees hired us to help bring peace to the people because nobody knows tree talk. <laughs> Yes, that's very true. I I can definitely get along with that thought. (laughs) (laughs) Where can people go to find out more about you, Rachel, especially when it comes to the the Loveland Foundation? Because you're doing amazing things here and people need to love and support you. 
Thank you. My my personal work lives uh, a lot on social media, uh, on Instagram in particular, Rachel.Cargill. The Loveland Foundation is at thelovelandfoundation.org, and you can see all of the incredible work that they're doing. And uh, my book, A Renaissance of Our Own, is out tomorrow, and people can read my memoir and read much more about me uh, than I could have ever said in this space. So I'm grateful to uh, be in community and conversation with those who enter. Oh, it's going to be a summer read. It's going to be a summer read. And I wouldn't be shocked if somebody from from streaming television doesn't pick this thing up and say, you know what? I think we need to make a series out of this. Oh, I'll, yes, I'll, I'll keep you posted. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Please come back to this show anytime in the future because the door is always going to be open for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? You too. You too. Thank you.